Zoom. Uh, we have an exciting talk again. Uh, as you notice, we had that this is the fourth we have organized uh, in in two weeks, uh, and and uh, this one is um, was in, initiated by Abdullah uh, Moswes, who is our student, and um, uh, he will he will introduce Hafsa properly uh, because he deserves that that honor. And then, um, yeah, I, I wanted to say also that that as it happens, we will have one of Hafsa's colleagues uh, on a Monday majlis next week, uh, next Monday, and I will put into the chat the the details of of this talk. is is by uh, Yusha Patel on how to think about Muslim difference, and I. Uh, and then, then I will I will just switch physically space with, uh, place with with uh, Abdullah, and he will he will introduce uh, Hafsa uh, Abdullah. Yeah. Right, just to um, the chat, I put in the chat. So that's that's the talk next Monday, and then we will we will slow down a bit, but still we will have the weekly weekly majlises. Like a big brother. Thank you very much, Stvan, uh, for kindly uh, agreeing to to host this event. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to to welcome Dr. Hafsa uh, here to Exeter, uh, and to welcome everyone who's in here as well. Um, of course, uh, it's very difficult to start without mentioning the events of the last few days uh, in historic Palestine. Um, and so I'm really pleased, actually, and very honored to be able at this time, at this particular time, to also be hosting uh, a talk on this really important topic that I'm, I'm, I'm also really pleased to have Dr. Hafsa here as, 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 our, as our speaker, um, because she is, of course, one of the most eloquent writers, I think, on this topic. Um, and, of course, the book itself uh, covers, I think, uh, an angle that's not really explored very often in the literature. And so just to, to, to do an intro, um, as, as I promised to do, um, Hafsa Kanjwal is an assistant professor of South Asian history in the Department of History at Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania, where she teaches courses on the history of the modern world, South Asian history, and Islam in the modern world. As a historian of modern Kashmir, she's the author of Colonizing Kashmir, State Building Under Indian Occupation, the book uh, that's present here in front of us. Um, copies of which you may buy after the session. Um, they're selling, I guess we're selling here for 20 pounds. I think their market rate is 25, so is a good discount uh, if, uh, if anyone is, is kind of on the fence and this maybe pushes them over it. Um, the book examines how the, Indian, how the Indian and Kashmir governments utilize state building to entrench India's colonial occupation of Kashmir in the aftermath of partition. Hafsa has written and spoken on her research for a variety of news outlets, including the Washington Post, Al Jazeera English, and the BBC. Um, and so in the spirit of uh, the way that we do things on the Monday Majlis, which this is not one, but it's in the format of it, I am really pleased to hand over to Hafsa, who is going to start by telling us a little bit about her, her academic journey and how she arrived eventually at this book. Um, before we talk about the, the, the book itself. And so um, please, I'm very happy to hand over to Dr. Hafsa Kandral. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. It's really such a pleasure to be here at Exeter. It's my first trip here. Um, so I want to first, of course, thank the Institute for Arab and Islamic Studies, uh, the Center for the Study of Islam, Professors Isfan and Abdullah for both um, for hosting me um, today. So in terms of my own personal journey, um, I wanted to kind of give you a bit of the context to how I got into this work. Um, it's, of course, a personal story because I was born in Kashmir. And my family left Kashmir when I was about six during the height of um, a mass popular uprising um, against the Indian state in the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s. And so my parents moved to the United States. Um, we still kind of, of course, kept much of our Kashmiri identity. Um, we were in a community where there were a lot of uh, Kashmiris who had also kind of either recently moved um, because of pol the political situation um, or had been in the US for decades working in different professions. And growing up, because I was immersed in this community, um, the politics of the place were always talked about. And so I always was attuned to the kinds of um, stories that you know we would hear about the history, the, what's going on at present and so on. Um, and so when I was in applying to colleges, I applied to um, work or study international relations. Um, at that time, I wanted to join the Foreign Service of the United States government, which is really crazy to think about now. Um, but my idea was that if you, know, if you could be in those positions of power and privilege, you could perhaps shape foreign policy towards how, especially a situation like Kashmir was being dealt with at that time. Um, I got to Georgetown, I enjoyed it of course, but was very much like, okay, this is not how we're gonna resolve this, this issue. Um, and so I worked for a year at um, a nonprofit um, and I was just kind of confused about what to do next. Um, and I thought maybe nonprofit work or international development would be another possible mechanism of making some kind of influence. Um, and the nonprofit where I worked, uh, actually, I ended up quitting because of their stance on Palestine, which I could maybe talk about later. Um, and so my boss at the time, though, had told me that, um, you know, it seems like you're meant for academia because you are always criticizing things, but you offer no solutions. And so I guess that is how I kind of was like, okay, maybe this is a, um, a possibility for me. Um, when I was applying to PhD programs and master's programs right after kind of working for a year after undergrad, um, I looked at every possible discipline. Um, I looked at Islamic studies, I looked at history, anthropology, um, and I think there was one or two more um, and applied broadly because I didn't really have the mentorship to be like, OK, you have to pick a discipline. You have to find an advisor. I just applied broadly and I managed to get into the Ph.D. program at Michigan um, in history and women's studies, where I basically began my training as a doctoral student in, in modern South Asian history. Um, and so that took about seven years. Um, I graduated in 2017 and I've been working at Lafayette College since. And to work on Kashmir um, in the kind of broader South Asian history um, is, is not easy. There's a lot of kind of um, resistance to especially these, the kinds of the kind of story that I'll, I'll be sharing with you today. Um, but I guess thinking through the, the theme of the Majlis and, um, and kind of sharing part of your journey, I guess I wanted to share two things. One is it's really important to surround yourself with people who can support you um, in your work, especially if the work is contentious or difficult. And sometimes you may find that support in very unexpected places. And that certainly was the case for me. Um, and so I think it was because of that mentorship and, and guidance that I got at really critical and important points that um, I was able to finish my PhD, get a job and finally um, publish this book. So. Um, so yeah, I think that's a bit about my my background, um, and hopefully we can I guess kind of just switch over to to the the book. Um, so I wanted to begin by laying out the argument and larger theoretical stakes um, of the project, which are inscribed in the title "Colonizing Kashmir: State Building Under Indian Occupation." And building on recent interventions in the field of critical Kashmir studies, the book historicizes India's relationship with Kashmir um, as a colonial occupation and argues that one of the key mechanisms of effective control by which India's occupation of Kashmir 
um, in the post-partition period took place was through the installation of client regimes, as well as the particular forms of state building and governance that took place under these regimes. So you might be wondering how can India, which had its own, um, it was a, it's a post-colonial state that had its own valorized anti-colonial movement against the British, how can they also be a colonial power? Um, part of what this book aims to do is rethink how we understand colonialism and also how we understand India's state formation. There remains an attachment in scholarship, especially on South Asia, to seeing colonialism as emerging only from the West to the global South and situating our present as a decolonial one. This approach fails to account for power dynamics within the global South, such as that between India and Kashmir, as well as the ways in which post-colonial nation states are also colonial. One reason why these forms of colonialism remain obscure is that geographic contiguity disguises imperial or colonial dynamics. Instead, these dynamics are seen as natural to state building, even if they face challenges or resistance. In other words, the fact that Kashmir is geographically contiguous to India creates the possibility for a less visible kind of colonialism than is possible overseas, such as that between Britain and the subcontinent. But another reason involves methodological nationalism. Work with the Arabs. Oh, there we go. Decades of work on Kashmir, primarily by Indian scholars, especially in the US Academy, have naturalized the Indian nation state form and denied its coloniality. And as a result, have refrained from critically examining, examining how this relationship between India and Kashmir was constructed in the first place. This has referred or resulted in what I've referred to as an epistemological violence on Kashmir, given the reflection of a colonial commitment to the integrity and territoriality of the Indian nation state, which in many ways is then also akin to the Indian state's own historical narrative that Kashmir is an integral part of India. You can see this with a whole host of scholarship that exists that seeks to explain what led to the armed rebellion of the uh, 1980s and 1990s. Every so often, you also have the same repetitive analyses explaining why Kashmiris are becoming alienated or estranged from Indian rule. In this body of work, the Kashmir issue has been reduced to a crisis of federalism, a crisis of democracy, or internal colonialism. The people's longstanding movement for sovereignty has been positioned as separatism, secessionism, ethno-nationalist insurgency, and of course, terrorism. So my book is not interested in asking why a people who never felt that they belonged suddenly become estranged or alienated. Rather, I'm interested in a set of inverse questions. How did India acquire Kashmir without the popular consent of its people? How did India and its client regimes normalize its occupation both within Kashmir and also for Indian and international audiences? What were the different modalities of rule that were in operation in this time? And finally, what insight can Kashmir provide us in ongoing theorizations of colonialism, settler colonialism, and occupation? To answer these questions, I look at a decade in Kashmir's recent history from 1953 to 1963 to understand how Kashmir was made integral to India. In August 1953, Bakshi Ghulam Muhammad to the left led a coup against the state of Jammu and Kashmir's first prime minister, Sheikh Abdullah. At this time, the entire princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, so this was under British colonial rule, uh, Jammu and Kashmir was a princely state, it had its own uh, Maharaja. Um, the people of the state uh, were um, involved in an anti-monarchical uprising against the Maharaja. And subsequently, the state became divided between the two new nation states of India and Pakistan following the first India-Pakistan war from 1947 to 1948. The United Nations had called for a plebiscite to take place once hostilities ceased so that Kashmiris could determine their future. Part of the territory known today as Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan, which is in the green, came under Pakistan, while a substantial part came under Indian control, the region referred to as Jammu and Kashmir, Indian occupied Kashmir, or simply um, sometimes just Kashmir. And this is where I conducted my research. So this is the area. Um, the Valley of Kashmir in particular, but there's Jammu and um, Ladakh as well here. 
Right from 1947, India began to colonize the part of Kashmir under its rule. It placed its own client regimes in power and negotiated some level of autonomy, which was enshrined in something called Article 370. It, um, and this was an article in the Indian Constitution. The article itself, as many critical Kashmir studies scholars have argued, was a colonial treaty that was meant to placate Kashmir's client regimes into thinking that being under Indian rule would provide them with significant autonomy. It allowed the state to have its own constitution, lawmaking body, and the leader of the state was even called a prime minister, and leaders of other Indian states were called chief ministers. So um, residency rights of land ownership and employment were also restricted to Kashmir state subjects. The Indian government was just supposed to be in charge of communications, defense, and foreign affairs. Yet the first prime minister, Sheikh Abdullah, who had initially agreed to Kashmir's accession to India, began to backtrack. He was increasingly concerned with rising Hindu nationalism, as well as the Indian government's attempts to erode the agreed upon autonomy of the Kashmir state by moving beyond their restricted mandate. He was removed in a coup by India and replaced by his deputy Bakshi. Bakshi was in power for a decade from 1953 to 1963. A shrewd politician, Bakshi had been a ground worker for the Abdullah-led National Conference and so was very familiar with local politics. The Indian government tasked Bakshi with promoting Kashmir's contested accession to India domestically and internationally while repressing popular political aspirations for merger with Pakistan or independence. After violently quashing protests that arose in the aftermath of Sheikh Abdullah's arrest, Bakshi turned his attention to state building and implemented a number of educational and economic policies. During his time in power, the Kashmir Assembly, which was an undemocratic entity that was filled with National Conference loyalists, confirmed Kashmir's accession to India and sought greater financial and administrative integration with the Indian Union, undermining Kashmir's autonomy. Bakshi's period oversaw crucial, crucial shifts in India's political and economic relationship with Kashmir towards concrete material integration. Yet Bakshi knew that in order for his relationship, this relationship and his rule to be legitimized, Kashmiris had to be convinced that this relationship was in their best interests, and they had to form an emotional bond in favor of India. Bakshi was also compelled to respond to the economic and social aspirations of the people, especially Kashmir's Muslim majority population who had long suffered unjust economic and social policies. What is astounding about his state building project is that he left no stone unturned in transforming the state and utilized a range of actors from bureaucrats, educators, the cultural intelligentsia, workers, peasants, tourism operators, and Indian filmmakers for this purpose. With financial assistance from the government of India, the Kashmir government established a number of public uh, institutions and development projects, including schools, colleges, and universities, hospitals, roads, tunnels, irrigation, and power projects, as well as cultural centers, stadiums, and social welfare organizations. So these two images are from 1956, during the opening of what was called the Jawahar Tunnel, named after the prime minister, um, or also known as the Banihal Tunnel. And the reason why this tunnel was significant is that before this tunnel was, was built, um, there was no all year round access uh, between the Indian mainland and Kashmir. Um, so for about three to six months of the year, because of snow in the mountains, um, people could not actually go by road. And so this tunnel, which was built through the mountains, is what basically allowed that year-long connectivity to exist. Um, and even in the speeches uh, by Bakshi at this time, he would say that this, this is basically going to create that emotional integration that the people of Kashmir and mainland India need. So when I began my PhD research about a decade ago, I found that most of the scholarship focused primarily on, on Kashmir, focused primarily on the events surrounding the 1947 partition, and then the period after the late 1980s when the armed rebellion and mass popular uprising began. There was very little critical scholarship to help us understand the, this period in between, and therefore I was drawn to it. The dominant narrative about this period, both to a certain extent in popular memory, as well as um, scholarship, is that things were normal during this time, and that it was only because of Pakistani interference or India's lack of commitment to development, secularism, and democracy that Kashmiris became disillusioned, leading to the rebellion and then the intense militarization and human rights violations committed by the Indian army. 
Now, we may associate development work and efforts at prosperity by the state by building roads, tunnels, increasing employment opportunities, and enhancing tourism as laudable things for people of a region. But I argue that it is precisely through the ruse of state building that India colonized Kashmir through client leaders like Bakshi. The decade that Bakshi was in power consolidated the contours of India's colonial occupation by relying on those very same discourses and practices of development, secularism, integration, normalization, and empowerment. And I historicize India's occupation and show that it may have looked different in this time period in comparison to what happened in the late 1980s, but it was still very much involved in suppressing Kashmiri demands for self-determination and sovereignty. So the different chapters of the book uh, look at the ways in which India's colonial occupation operated through Bakshi's state building practices as a client regime and specifically through international diplomacy, uh, film, tourism, education, economic development and cultural reform. I won't have time to go into all of them, but I'm going to highlight two, um, two main themes uh, during the remainder of my talk. Um, but I did want to talk a bit about these two images. So in terms of international diplomacy, this was obviously in the 1950s when the Cold War is going on. Um, and this is a visit, a very high profile visit to Kashmir at the time by the Soviet leadership. Um, and you can see the bottom right picture uh, of Bakshi feeding uh, the Soviet premier Gustavo, which is a Kashmiri meat delicacy. Um, and so like in local, like language, or I guess in local folk language, is, this is called Gustaba diplomacy, where basically the Indian government and uh, Bakshi invites uh, the Soviets to come see the development that's happening in Kashmir that they are, um, you know, in terms of the roads they're building and so on and so forth. Um, and after this visit, the Soviets begin to take India's side on the international stage. Um, and any subsequent uh, resolution that's passed or brought to the floor of the United Nations Security Council is vetoed by, by the Soviets. Um, and one of the things that was kind of shared with me is that these, these people that you kind of see on the sides, many of them were bussed in by the government from different villages and towns across Kashmir. They were told that they would be provided a feel, uh, free meal and that they would um, they would basically see like a foreign dignitary, dignitary. And so when people saw this, they were just you know, excited to see a foreign dignitary, but it was interpreted as um, by the Soviet leaders as Kashmiris being happy under Indian rule. So that's why this visit was really uh, significant. Um, okay, so the first theme that I wanna talk about is the politics of life. Um, and I wanted to share with you a bit about um, what this meant. So in a conversation with an elder during my field work in Kashmir, I was told about a particular high ranking bureaucrat who had recently passed away. And the relative mentioned that this person had not been very educated. He had only passed matric or what was the equivalent of 10th grade, but he had been given a clerical job by Bakshi who had written his job appointment on a matchbox. And as oral histories go, there had been many in the 1950s and 1960s who would come across Bakshi in, their, in uh, his visits to their towns and villages. And he would ask them if they had a job and if they didn't would, would write them an appointment on just small slips of paper or more notably on matchboxes. Um, and so this is kind of how he was able to create this um, informal patronage uh, network. So to understand the politics of life, it's important to first understand how the Indian government and Kashmir's client regime saw the Kashmir issue. In these early years, both saw the Kashmir issue not on political terms, meaning not as a question of sovereignty or self-determination, but rather in economic terms, mean, uh, meaning um, or linked to a better standard of living. Kashmiris were depicted as being malleable, that while they may have varying political aspirations, they had the potential to be integrated subjects as long as they could experience the benefits of Indian rule. So both governments thought that Kashmiri sentiments could be managed or in many ways bought through state planning. And they attempted to show Kashmiris the many benefits that they could incur under India. And so I argue that the early decades of India's colonial occupation were marked by a politics of life. And I actually borrowed this term from the scholar Nev Gordon who uses it similarly to describe how Israel attempted to create prosperity in the West Bank and Gaza Strip after the 1967 war. 
The politics of life refers to how both the Indian government and the Kashmir client regimes propagated development, empowerment, and progress to secure the well-being of Kashmir's population and to normalize the occupation for multiple audiences, including internationally. It entailed foregrounding the day-to-day -day concerns of employment, food, education, and provision of basic services. At the same time, questions of self-determination and Kashmir's political future were being suppressed. So this approach to Kashmir was furthered by the Indian leadership, including the first prime minister, as well as Kashmir's client regimes. In a letter to Sheikh Abdullah, which is actually how I start the book, Nehru, the Indian, first Indian prime minister writes, it must be remembered that the people of the Kashmir Valley and roundabout, though highly gifted in many ways, in intelligence, in artisanship, et cetera, are not what we call a virile people. They are soft and addicted to easy living. The common people are primarily interested in a few things and honest administration and cheap and adequate food. If they get this, then they are more or less content. Nehru is also reportedly um, wants to have told Sheikh Abdullah that India would bind Kashmir in golden chains. And it did. The government intended to ensure that with, with an improved standard of living and greater prosperity, Kashmiri Muslim sentiments would shift in favor of India towards a form of integration. So how are these seemingly state building measures, in fact, instruments of Indian colonization of Kashmir? For that, we'll turn to Rice. A member of the Kashmir cabinet under Bakshi, VP Dar, what once propounded the theory that Kashmiris knew little of politics, what they cared about was a hearty meal, and they could be won over gastronomically. Abdullah was invested in financial autonomy for Kashmir, and he had told Kashmiris that they should rather survive on a diet of potatoes before relying on rice subsidies from India. Immediately after his arrest and to quell the protest, Bakshi's government received agricultural subsidies from India, drastically decreasing the price of rice and grains. It was estimated that rice subsidies under Abdullah were nearly 2 million rupees. Under Bakshi, the cost, which was met entirely by the Indian government, reached nearly 16 million rupees per year. As a result, in some areas, the price of rice dramatically fell from 60 to 70 rupees per unit of measure to eight. And immediately after Bakshi took power, the government of India made an emergency allotment of 40,000 pounds of rice and nearly 900 vehicles were brought the rice from the mainland to Srinagar. But what's really interesting about um, what this story about rice is that Bakshi managed to leverage the threat of political instability and the geopolitical significance of Kashmir for India's reputation internationally to secure an ongoing and high amount of food aid. For example, between 1956 and 1957, officials in the Ministry of Food and the Indian government were aghast that the Kashmir government would continue to request such high amounts, even as the production of rice was increasing within the state. They were willing to give 20,000 tons of rice, but not the 36,700 tons that the Kashmir government had requested. And Indian government officials would repeatedly request that the Kashmir government increase the price for local procurement so that there could be a decrease in the demand. At times, they um, also uh, suggested an increase in the price of subsidized rice or a reduction in the amount of rice meant for one adult per day. But Bakshi protested, stating that the food um, supply in Kashmir remain, remained perilous. Um, and that, uh, especially because that recently there were, had been floods and hailstorms. Um, and in these two slides, I think I'll actually go, yeah, so he's talking about how the crops have been badly damaged. Um, but then he basically says that there were, the position of Jammu and Kashmir was materially different from other states in India, that there were other political factors. The government of India should not risk with the state as numerous political implications were involved in the distribution of rice at reduced prices. He refused to raise the price of rice and eventually the Indian Ministry of Home wrote to the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, requesting it to take into consideration the special circumstances of the state and then subsequently additional, additional tons of rice and patty would be deployed. So this example highlights how integral the rice subsidization policy in Kashmir was to India's colonial occupation. Subsidization of rice in Kashmir was in sharp contrast to the government of India's overall food policy that relied on scarcity and self-reliance, which suggests the need for the Indian government to maintain a different development strategy in Kashmir, but also shows how Bakshi was able to leverage political instability in Kashmir to get the best food aid for Kashmiris. 
oftentimes to the sheer dismay of some Indian officials. Bakshi envisioned a political economy in which Kashmir would receive ongoing aid from the government of India. As a result, his was a time of plenty. To get the most from the Indian government, all Bakshi would do was refer to the political sensitivities that he was subject to. The provision of aid and abundance under India was intended to remake sentiments towards India and provide legitimacy to his government. If Kashmiris could see the kind of ta tangible benefits that they could get um, within this, this context, then they would likely give their consent to Indian rule. And so this is fundamentally how the politics of life operated. And in subsequent years, the diets of Kashmiris, especially in rural areas, began to change and rely heavily on rice. Rice became associated as a marker of social status, and the flood of rice into Kashmir during Bakshi times, during his time, remains one of his lasting legacies. So, in fact, when I visited um, for my for my field work, my diaspora sensibilities were a bit aghast that family members would eat rice not once, twice, but sometimes even three times a day. And so, when I would be kind of su surprised or amazed by that, they would actually tell me to take it up with Bakshi um, because that's what he's remembered in by in, in kind of uh, popular narratives. So what I think is really significant about um, this is that greater financial integration with India was something that the Kashmir government under Bakshi forced the Indian metropole to concede. Colonial occupation is not always a top-down process, but one that can encourage those in the middle, um, including a comprador or collaborator class to further and manipulate. This explains in part why it often becomes intractable. And the reason why I think kind of in the broader picture in terms of understanding settler colonialism or colonialism or occupation, why, why this is also significant is that we often imagine that these are spaces of immense dispossession, violence, war, and marginalization. And of course, many times they are, and that has been the predominant story in Kashmir um, for, for decades. But then only seeing colonialism as being defined by manifest violence obscures our understandings of the other ways in which it can operate through giving, through development and empowerment and the banality of everyday life. And as a result of some of these economic policies, uh, the Indian government was basically able to position Kashmir as a begging bowl and itself as singularly capable of providing the people their livelihood, entrenching, I argue, its colonial occupation through fiscal and not direct military means in these early years. The second theme that I wanted to discuss regards secularism and what exactly that secularism entails if India's secular credentials are grounded in the context of a colonial occupation. Indian leaders like Nehru would basically say that India's secular ideals are exemplified through its only Muslim majority state, Jammu and Kashmir. So you might think that when it came to representations of Kashmir in the broader discursive domain, Kashmir's Muslim histories or geographies might at least be made reference to, even if they were supposed to have upheld Indian secularism. But this was not the case. To say Kashmir was a Muslim majority region that had chosen to join India was largely good PR for international audiences. Yet domestically in secular nationalist imaginaries of Kashmir, Kashmir is presented as a Hindu space and the heart of Indian civilization from the ancient to present times. How then do we make sense of Indian secularism at this time? My book argues that Indian secularism and Hindu majoritarianism are inextricable to each other. I show how Indian uh, I show how Hindu geographies, imaginaries, and histories, especially through the sole reliance on the 12th century um, Sanskrit text, the Rajatarangi by Kalhana, were central to secular discourses. Producing a good Kashmiri secular subject was deployed as a mechanism to criminalize Muslim political aspirations or alternate visions of nationhood and belonging. Ultimately, Kashmiri Muslims were politically useful for India's secular politics of inclusion, but this forcible inclusion is aligned with assimilationist settler colonial narratives about Kashmiri's, Kashmir's history and recent past. As the book shows, the secular was used to both erase and tame Muslim histories of Kashmir. One of the ways that this happened is through film and tourism. Film and tourism have served in many ways to territorialize India's colonial occupation, and they continue to do so. Both sought to produce Indian colonial desires, anxieties, and claims over the occupied territory. Dozens of leading Indian films from this time were made in Kashmir, and Kashmir was often referred to as the top tourist destination in India. Kashmir was a place to be seen and experienced even if through the cinematic lens. The use of tourism in particular to enable colonialism is not uh, restricted to Kashmir. 
And these are both ads from the 1950s. Um, the one on the right, of course, is from the D Directorate of Tourism of the, uh, the Jammu and Kashmir government. The one on the left is from the Hawaii Visitors Bureau, um, so the state government in Hawaii. Um, and they're both from the 50s, so you can see like some of the similarities in terms of their aesthetics. But what I think is really compelling or interesting is um, two things. One is this one here says, Hawaii invites you with year-round charm, come any time, come now. Um, and here it also says, come now or during the season of your favorite sport. And this is also part of this year-round year -round charm. So these are basically places that can offer you something to do and visit um, all year round. And in other representations of Kashmir, there is also kind of this gendered representations of Kashmiri women, the beauty, et cetera, and so on. Um, and so there are some striking similarities between how both are situated within the Indian and the, the US context. And just to give you a sense of how some of this continues, this is a Jammu and Kashmir tourism ad from 2020 after the abrogation, which I'll talk about. Um, and so Kashmir is calling here. Uh, it's also been calling in the 1950s. Um, and I think the, the term Kashmir calling refers perhaps to Nehru's um, quote about Kashmir, where he once uh, compared Kashmir to a beautiful woman that seemed like she was calling to him. And so maybe that's what the, the reference is made to. Using film and tourism specifically, I argue that representations of Kashmiri history and identity were selective, partial, and distorting, ignoring complex historical processes and providing a simplified narrative of Kashmir's natural incorporation into the Indian nation. In their travels, Indian tourists saw and experienced Kashmir in ways that legitimized Indians, India's symbolic claims over Kashmir and promoted the uh, naturalization of Indian empire on colonized land. In tourist guidebooks, Kashmir's Muslim histories were either completely erased or relegated, as is what happens across the subcontinent, to stories of invaders. For example, Muslim rulers were referred to as conquerors, whereas earlier Hindu or Buddhist rulers, despite their varied origins, were seen as indigenous to Kashmir. Muslim sacred sites were given a brief mention, while Hindu sacred sites were central to the tourist experience. Few of the Kashmir films even depicted any Kashmiri Muslim characters. The ones that did were either simplistic and rustic, like Mamdu in the film Arzu, or Raja, um, played by Shashi Tharoor in the film uh, Jab Jab Phool Kile. Raja's character was seen as paradoxically in need of integration to India, or ultimately the authentic Indian subject. It was also during this time when Hindu religious tourism to Kashmir was strengthened, as one um, guidebook mentioned Kashmir was a holy land for Hindus, but Nara stands as a molehill mole hill before a mountain. Many guidebooks also had a special uh, section on the Amarnath pilgrimage, heightening the significance of Kashmir for the Hindu faithful. So why is all of this significant? Scholars of settler colonialism have argued that not all states eliminate subject populations by killing them off or driving them off the land. The elimination can also occur by assimilation or what I call integration in the book where the idea is to rid the people of their own sense of history and identity and bring them into line with the state, with the colonial state. In this case, India's politics of secular inclusion linked to the erasure or taming of Muslimness and making Kashmir exclusively a Hindu holy land was intimately tied to processes of settler colonialism. Different aspects of the state building pro project created their own subversions. Bakshi himself was replaced by the Indian government once he stopped serving their purpose. This is the fate of Kashmir's client politicians up until today. Even though his time in power completely entrenched the legal, political, economic, and social infrastructure of colonial occupation, it did not succeed in emotionally integrating Kashmiris to India. In fact, the decades of his rule led to even greater popular movements for self-determination. Even if the chains are golden, they will still need to be broken. So I wanted to end this overview by bringing this all to the present. On August 5th, 2019, India embarked on the next phase of its settler colonial project in Kashmir by formerly revoking Kashmir's semi-autonomous status. It is not an exaggeration to say that in the past four years, Kashmiris have been effectively silenced as India has changed a series of laws that allow its citizens and armed forces to buy land and settle in the region in order to, uh, in order to change the demographics and quash the movement for self-determination. 
These developments are also happening under a brutal neoliberal order, which is making Kashmir a site of global extraction and environmental destruction. In recent years, the Indian government has completely gone after all forms of political dissent in Kashmir, from imprisoning the pro-freedom leadership to targeting writers, journalists, artists, academics, human rights defenders, and activists in a variety of ways and creating new forms of propaganda. Writing or saying anything that portrays the Indian government's actions in a negative light, forget even speaking about freedom or liberation, is a cause for harassment, interrogation, and imprisonment. Much of this is also being replicated in India as political developments under Modi's Hindu nationalist government have led to fears of genocide against Indian Muslims, as well as an increasing realization of their second class citizenship. Examining India's state formation from the perspective of Kashmir sheds light into India's descent into an authoritarian, undemocratic Hindu majoritarian state. In scholarship and advocacy efforts against Hindu nationalism, there is a tendency to reinforce the idea that India was once secular, once pluralist, once democratic, but has now been transformed into an ethno-nationalist state that commits human rights violations. There is, of course, no question that the rise of Hindu nationalism has exacerbated India's challenges and that things have gotten categorically worse. Yet, with this increasing nostalgia for an earlier version of India, as a result of rampant Hindu nationalism in India today, the inherent violence of that secular liberal order, as well as its entanglements with Hindu majoritarian uh, Hindu majoritarianism, is erased. This nostalgia completely erases how colonialism and domination were at the root of Indian state formation, not just in Kashmir, but in other places as well. And more importantly, Kashmir and the other regions at the margins or frontiers of the national narrative are not an exception, but remain integral to India's state formation as a colonial power. To put it simply, India's foundational moment cannot be viewed as separate from its colonial occupation of Kashmir. Treating Kashmir as an exception, especially when Kashmir was employed to symbolize the Indian nation, while lauding India's otherwise secular or democratic character, is akin to denying settler colonization in the context of US state formation. In some ways, we can see Kashmir and other zones of colonial occupation as a test case for the Indian state to practice various forms of power, disciplinary, sovereign, biopolitical, and necropolitical. These strategies would be utilized in the mainland, especially against populations that are deemed the threat, Muslims, Dalits, and tribal communities, and more recently, anyone who does not align with the Hindu nationalist project. Therefore, instead of looking for inspiration in a, in a rather uninspiring past, would it not be better to envision more imaginative and liberatory futures? And finally, even though my book aims to shed light on Kashmir's history, my hope is that it will be useful to other sites that are like Kashmir. One of my main hopes is that this book will contribute towards a historiography of states that do not exist, have not been allowed to exist, and peoples who have been denied self-determination and the right to exercise their sovereignty. And there are many, Kashmir is not exceptional. A number of other nations and communities have been brought into the fold of nation states without their consent and remain under colonial occupation, apartheid, and war. Modern day borders do not adhere to people's understandings of place and history. And so modern nation states have used varying modalities of control, whether manifest violence, or the politics of life to establish their rule in these places where they lack legitimacy. But of course, people have and continue to resist. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Hafsa. I, I want to thank want Abdullah, to Abdullah once more, Abdullah Marcus. Abdullah Marcus. Who, who invited Hafsa for for this magnificent talk? Uh, I, I really very much enjoyed the the richness of it and and the the beautiful balance you 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 established. Um, it's really remarkable. Um, yeah, when when what you mentioned about other states and so on, just just next door. Uh, to Kashmir, there is that, and then there is Xinjiang, Uyghur land. So, and, and and the parallels are are incredible. So, both what you said about colonialism, was, I'm, I think it's it's so well nuanced and and deep. And I also love what you said at the beginning about the decolonial. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, upgrades I had here 
uh, in, in exposure of, of, of a PhD student was, was on how the Ahmadiyya Muslims are kind of colonized within, within Britain, uh, so, or at least under, under threat uh, by, by the Muslim, uh, by majority Muslim uh, minority within Britain. So, 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 so colonial, uh, colonial, 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 colonization and oppression, oppression is, is, is a much is a more complex, complex phenomenon than, than we often think about. It. So, so thank, thank you for reading this, this, this uh, yeah, so, 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 so eloquent paper. And uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, once, once more, I want to mention that, that uh, 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 this colleague, uh, Yusha uh, Patel will, will come. Not physically, uh, not in person, but but online uh, to join us on 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 Monday, and he will he will talk about an extremely interesting topic, which will be the Muslim difference. And oh, sorry. Um, Muslim difference, and uh, yes, so I I I conclude the the recording. And uh, and we we go to the to the questions here here and online. Oh, one more thing before before I are for uh, get if you if uh, <clears throat> uh, those online or or you in person here want to have a discussion with, with Hafsa, please let us know, and then she will she will come in tomorrow morning uh, from ten to eleven. Those online, please please write. Uh, 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 in the chat and those here please please tell us after after we finish um those online who have questions please please just uh, type it in or, or raise your hand i will i will look look at it um yes Abdullah, do you want to say something do you want to say something before uh no other than thank you very much for for, for that uh, excellent summary of the book and i mean i'm very keen to open up the questions from the audience um, and so I'm not going to take up any time unnecessarily. Okay, then I close the recording. Thank you.